Okay, I think we are live. I'm going to mute. We're good. Hi, and welcome to the traditional ecological knowledge, science, and management webinar series. My name is Regina Chikazola, and I'm here with Save California Salmon. And today I'm coming from you from Karuk land. Um, so thank you to the for letting me be on their land. And um, if you do want to support the Karuk tribe ever, then you can do so through their through their website, but also if you would like to support Save California Salmon, you can, um, we will drop the link in the chat. And um, we just wanted to announce that we do have a new website up called Water Justice. And on that website, there is a petition to Governor Newsom asking him to please provide some water into both the Sacramento and Klamath river systems in order to stop fish kills this year. There is a day of action planned for May 4th and many of us will be testifying to the California State Water Quality Control Board on Tuesday, May 4th. There will also be a rally in Sacramento at noon on May 4th. Um, and we really hope that people can join us in that day. You can also um, tweet to Gavin Newsom, you can call him, you can sign the petition, but please do everything you can to try to make sure that we our salmon in the Bay Delta and in the Klamath River this year. It's a critical time for the fish. So with that, I'm really excited to announce our guest for today. Um, we have Cody Hendrickson, or Hendrickson, um, and he is with Save California Salmon and the Humboldt State University Native American Studies um, program, and he is um, part of the Food Sovereignty Lab at Humboldt State University. We also have Melissa Tayaba, and she is part of the Shingle Springs um, Band of Miwok Indians, and I will um, further introduce Melissa later, but um, first we're going to start with a quick presentation from Cody to um, let us know why estuaries are and to talk a little bit about um, what the bay, why the best Bay Delta estuary is important and what it means to um, native people within California. Um, so after the introduction, we'll move on to Melissa and thank you so much for being here today. All right, everyone, can you see my screen here? All right. Yakali do Cody Henriksen Ilan Shida Lydia Enseleski Shunkta Nilan Fedora Kwasnikov Shinknikta Nilan Denina Chusukpiak Ilan Shida Shikaya Hide Ninan Chikilan. Hello everyone. My name is Cody Henriksen. I just told you a little bit about my family, and I am also of Denina and Sukpiak descent and a proud enrolled member of the Ninilchik Village Tribe of Alaska. And I'm here today to speak to you a little bit about the importance of estuaries and deltas in an ecological respect and also to indigenous peoples worldwide. Estuaries and deltas are an important part of healthy ecosystems all over the world. They are nurseries and habitats essential for numerous cultural keystone species that support indigenous peoples wherever they are found. Cultural keystone species are of exceptional significance to cultures of, or a people and can be identified by their prevalence in language, cultural practices, ceremonies, traditions, diets, medicines, material items, and histories of communities. The loss of even a single cultural keystone species would have devastating effects felt throughout their respective cultures. Healthy estuaries and deltas maintain water quality that benefits both people and marine life. These systems help maintain biodiversity by producing a diverse range of unique habitat, habitats, including but not limited to mangrove forests, salt marshes, mudflats, and seal grass beds, which are critical for the survival of many species and indigenous peoples. Estuaries and deltas also act as buffers protecting lands from crashing waves and storms. They help prevent soil erosion and they soak up excess flood waters and tidal surges. Estuaries and deltas are not only important for biodiversity and healthy ecosystems, but are a place for the gathering of traditional medicines, foods, basket weaving materials, and are held in high regard to the indigenous peoples who traditionally inhabit them. 
These systems free contact were managed by indigenous peoples of California and in order to return to the abundance these systems once produced, indigenous peoples and their concerns and demands should be at the center of restoration and preservation projects. Threats to estuaries and deltas include, but are not limited to, urban sprawl, industrial pollution, nutrient pollution, oil and gas drilling, dikes, dams, diversions, and dredging, reduced freshwater inflows, over-harvesting of resources, invasive species, climate change, sea level rise, and ocean acidification. Some of the current projects that are also affecting estuaries and deltas in California are listed here, but also are not limited to the Trump water plan, the state water plan, proposal to raise the Shasta Dam, the proposal to build Sites Reservoir, the Delta Tunnel, the Westlands Permit Contract, the Delta Water Quality Control Plan updates, the FERC Dam relicensing all over the Sierras, agricultural pollution permits and water rights applications. The Bay Delta is a heavily impacted watershed. There are over 14,000 dams in California and many are on the Bay Delta tributaries. The Delta and SF Bay suffer from levees and dikes. Many of the state and federal water projects in California target California tribal lands and trust lands. And something that is also important to know is that the restriction of the natural flow of these estuaries and deltas has also had devastating impacts to these systems. The Central Valley project includes things like the dams and diversions and watersheds are a part of the Central Valley state and federal water projects. These projects use many of the same diversions and canals, but they operate in different dams, operate different dams. The federal water project alone has 20 dams. The SWP has required the construction of 21 dams and more than 700 miles of canals and pipelines. The federal water is managed by the Bureau of Reclamation and mainly feeds farms. The state project is mainly based in the Sierras and mainly feeds cities. The projects are usually analyzed together and coordinated. There are also many privately held dams. Many of the Bay Delta watersheds used to have abundant runs of anadromous fish like salmon and other fish that utilize cold water in upper watersheds. There are even runs of, there are runs of salmon for every season. Now that so much of the water is dammed, diked, and diverted, there is little habitat left for these critical species. This has led to a winter run and spring run Chinook, green sturgeon, and delta smelt facing extinction in our immediate future. Reverse flows also pose a large threat from large diversions in the delta and threaten fish. Most dams do not have this fish passage, leaving upstream tribes without valuable food sources and the ability to practice their cultures. And how do we protect these estuaries and dams? On the left maybe for y'all, I can't tell what y'all, how y'all are seeing it, is just a graphic that the EPA has put out that illustrates some of the ways we can actually protect them. And that includes things like reducing toxins that flow into these estuaries through our own systems, the use of native plants, adhering to no wake zones with your boat, um, respecting fish and other culturally important species, and to pave less things. But also as indigenous peoples, we have to realize that we must extend our protections beyond that and to support local tribes and indigenous peoples financially and through ad advocacy. And we also must support indigenous preservation and restoration initiatives, which includes centering indigenous peoples and their demands and concerns at the heart of conservation efforts. And I've got a short video here that from Save California Salmon that we are promoting for the, the protection of our juvenile salmon in the rivers. And I will play it here for you. Just let me make sure 
I am sharing my sound. Governor Newsom, we're counting on you. We've lived here for thousands of years. We fish on the river. We survive off the river. It was born here. This is where it's supposed to be. We are strongly in opposition of the Delta Tunnel. This proposal puts our entire livelihood in danger. The tribal people that live on the rivers depend on the river and the salmon is part of our cultural life way. We've been here for tens of thousands of years living this way of life. If they take the excess water from the reservoirs, there will be no water to release into the rivers on low flow years and the salmon will die. It would just be totally shameful if we lost all we have ever known for thousands of years. Don't approve any plans that would divert more water from the Trinity. Governor Newsom, do the right thing. And something to know about estuaries and deltas is that they used to naturally flood their banks periodically and the natural systems that they would go through annually are important to contributing to the healthy ecosystems that they support. Now with man-made diversions, dikes and dams, those natural systems and floodings are restricted and it has caused a great damage to our systems. And I am also going to send it over now to our speakers to tell us a little bit about the efforts they use in their local tribes. And let me start a new share for their presentation and we'll get going. Um, first, I wanted to um, introduce our speakers for today because um, we didn't do a full introduction at the beginning. Um, Melissa Tayaba is the vice chairperson of the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians. She is also the director of ecological knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge and a cultural teacher. She helps lead cultural revitalization efforts within her tribe and is passionate about teaching culture and tradition to other tribal members. Her work includes sharing the ways Aboriginal territories and the natural resources have historically been a utilized and tended by Nisan and Miwok people, teaching the importance of learning and passing down knowledge of traditional practices to the next generation of culture keepers and bringing cultural activities back into the tribal communities, such as basketry, regalia, bead making, traditional song and dance, ceremony, the identification and use of plants, land stewardship, sharing tribal history and language revitalization. Before becoming the TEK director, Melissa spent six years as a cultural researcher and 10 years as director of social services, all while sim simultaneously dedicating 15 years to tribal government in her capacity as a tribal council member and vice chair. She sits on various boards and committees within her tribe and is a member of the Delta Conveyance Project Stakeholders Engagement Committee convened California Department of Water Resources. She is also a member of the Delta Protection Commission's National Heritage Area Management Plan Advisory Committee. Melissa enjoys being outdoors, reconnecting to the land, gathering traditional materials for her basket weaving, and spending time along the rivers, tending natural resources of her tribe's ancestral homelands. And I believe there might be other people joining Melissa later in the program. Thank you, and she can introduce them. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Melissa Tayaba. Uh, currently, I am the vice chairwoman um, for the tribe. I am the director of uh, TEK Knowledge here um, at the tribe. And of course, I am a tribal member um, from Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians. Um, and today I'm going to kind of um, first just tell you about my tribe and give you a little bit of history um, and also tell you why the Delta is so important to us. So who we are and, and where we come from, 
Um, we are known as the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians. Uh, our original name was Verona Band of Homeless Indians. Um, we're a fe federally recognized tribe located in El Dorado County, um, which is about 40 miles east of the river. Um, you know, back in 1916, that's when the state um, gave us 160 acres of land. Um, we're a small tribe, we're, we're a little less than 600 and half of those people are our children. Um, and of course our ancestors were removed from our original homeland in Sutter, El Dorado, Yuba, Yolo and Sacramento, Placer and Amador counties. Um, and sometimes I think people get confused with our name. It's Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians. Um, but we are also Nisanan or Southern Maidu. And next slide. And this is just a map showing our, our Aboriginal village sites. And it just basically shows you the different counties that um, we're, we're from. And as you can see, um, the east and west banks of the Sacramento River, the confluence of the Sacramento and American the east and west banks of the Feather River and various points along Consumnes and leading all the way up into the crest of the Sierras. Um, our way of life centered upon the waterways. Our ancestors lived in various villages along the rivers. The Delta was our grocery store. It fed us, clothed us, housed us, kept us healthy, and in return, we tended the land that gave so much to us. Next slide. And then just giving a little bit of history on the impacts um, of settlers, the population of pre-contact Sacramento Valley native people was about 76,000. Um, European contact had devastated effect on these numbers. Miwok territory was impacted earlier than Nisanon because they were exposed to European contact and diseases via trappers, explorers, trade connections, and the mission system before the Nisanon to the north. And obviously because, you know, they're right next to each other, the Miwok and the Nisanon. So as they moved up, obviously Miwok would be affected first. The Spanish began to explore Miwok territory in the late 1700s and established Mission San Francisco in 1776 and the first Spanish expedition into Plains Miwok and Nisanon territory was led by Gabriel Morara in 1806. Um, the mission system, primarily Mission San Jose, began to absorb inland Miwok peoples as early as 1811 and Nisanon next. Next slide. Um, and this is just a, a, a map, an old map, but it actually shows the original waterway of the American River and the Sacramento River. And so this is what the river actually used to look like. And of course, it does not look like this today. And this is right there at downtown Sacramento. Land grants and Sutter. Um, I feel like I had to talk about Sutter because he obviously affected my family tremendously. Uh, he had a negative impact on my tribe in 1840. He established a fort on land granted to him by the Mexican government and he named it New Helvetia located in the south bank of the American River in our Nisanon ancestral territory and village site. Uh, Sutter engaged in cattle ranching, fur trapping, wheat farming, and other agricultural pursuits, and also developed a grist mill and sawmill. Much of his labor force was supplied by local Indians. And so that's just to kind of point out the devastation that started to happen in the Delta. Um, one effect of Sutter's role on the Nusanon was the disruption of family life, particularly by supplying Indian children to landowners. Um, Nisanon traditional life was also impacted by settlers taking Indian women and consorts and wives, including John Sutter and a number of his employees. It was under these conditions that the 1846 census of New Helvetia territory recorded 2,768 Nisanon and Miwok people. Next slide. 
In 1839, John Sutter with a group of Hawaiians arrived in New Sinan territory at a location along the American River about three miles above the confluence. And today it is known as Sutter's Landing, but historically it was not too far from the village of Pashune where my grandmother was born. Sutter exploited the Hawaiians and the Nisanon for slave labor and used them to build his fort, maintain the lands and recruit new workers. He engaged in slave trade, utilizing us, um, the natives, people of the region, which included the kidnapping and selling of women and children. And many of my relatives and ancestors were at Sutter's Fort as laborers, uh, wives, foremen, and soldiers. Um, and, you know, those are actual, that, that is real. Like my grandpa used to be one of his foremen and going back and looking into the diaries and there my grandpa is, it's stunning. Like, it's just crazy to actually think that. Um, the arrival of Sutter and the settlers that followed drove the Nisanan people from our homelands as village sites were abandoned and destroyed. And the Nisanon population was also devastated by the disease that European settlers brought with them as they entered the region. And of course, when gold was discovered in 1848, the gold rush hysteria caused the mass destruction of Nisanon territory, natural resources, and traditional way of life. Um, Verona. So Verona is actually located where the Feather River and the Sacramento River uh, meet at that point. Um, Pearson B. Reading explored and surveyed the Sacramento River. He identified a town at the confluence of the Sacramento and Feather Rivers in 1849, which was later known as Verona. Historically, the confluence of the Sacramento and Feather Rivers also marked the northernmost point of the Delta. The town was established near the New Sinan village of Wolok, which is the ancestral home of some of the original tribal members of, of my tribe. My great grandfather, John Kapu, was headman at Verona. He married my grandmother, a New Sinan woman named Pamela Clenzo, who was daughter of a New Sinan headman. And by marrying into the Hawaiian monarchy, California Indian women could protect their property and their children during a time when the kidnapping and stealing of Indian children was very common. Um, and this picture over here is John Kapu and my grandma and children were among those forced to march into Round Valley in 1863 during the Maidu Trail of Tears. However, they were able to make it back. And um, just really quick, I think a lot of people um, have kind of questioned, well, you're Shingle Springs Band and Miwok Indian, how are you Hawaiian? And so I just wanted to point out that is where our Hawaiian ancestry comes from, is, is from our grandpas. Next slide. And this is just a map showing the current Verona right now, today as it is. And as you can see, um, a lot of the landscape is just farming and we're down to a slither of natural um, plants and um, on the side of the river. So just wanted to point that out. And next slide. Land back. Um, one of the biggest victories I think that I've been able to witness um, while um, being here is getting our land back. Um, toward the end of 2020, my tribe was able to reclaim uh, Wolok or Verona. Um, and so we purchased the Verona Marina in Sutter County, which is a site of particular cultural significance since it was both a Nisanon village site and then later the Hawaiian fishing village of Verona. This location is where our ancestors lived together, creating a haven for our niece and on grandmothers and Hawaiian grandfathers. And on April 17th of this year, we held our spring dance and brought ceremony back to Verona, back to our land and back to the river. Um, and that was very touching and moving and, and exciting. Um, being back at the river gives us an opportunity to teach our tribal members about traditional ways, 
how our people originally utilized the waterways and ecosystem to help us continue to revitalize our culture and the importance of passing down this knowledge. And this, um, this is just pictures of our spring dance coming home. And so you can just see tribal members um, gathering and we also were, were able to um, bring back our Hawaiian dancing also. So just a moment in time um, that is so memorable. Okay. Um, you know, and we are survivors. Without a doubt, my people are the people of the valley and the Delta. The 19th century was a devastating hard time and my elders survived it. We should not be questioned about who we are and where we come from. We come from the land. My tribe and its peoples were the original scientists and we're just true genius people. We are alive, we are well, we are thinkers, dreamers, doctors, feather keepers, bow makers, basket weavers, fishermen and singers. And the Nisanan people discovered how to weave watertight baskets. Um, and baskets are everything. When you are born, you're put in a basket. We cooked our food in a basket. And when you die, you're in a basket. We have a relationship to the waterways of this region, a relationship with the land, the birds, the fish, and all it has provided and what it still offers us. We take care of the land and it takes care of, it takes care of us. Um, tech and our relationship with the Delta. And as I mentioned um, about baskets, um, we actually brought weaving back to our community. Like it must be at least <laughs> three or four years ago, maybe even five at this point. Um, and so bringing weaving back to our community really brought us back to the water and really made us conscious about, about the water, about the plants um, and, and their health. Um, traditional ecological knowledge is a term we use now to encompass how we have always lived as Native people. We live in a reciprocal relationship with the land and our environment. Tech is how we are interconnected with the natural world and how we have a responsibility to take care of the land, the wildlife, plant life, and natural resources. We have a special relationship with the Delta as it provided everything we needed. We use the Delta for hunting, fishing, gathering food, basketry materials, housing materials, clothing materials, medicine, and ceremony. The Delta is the heart of the region that sustained the numerous plant, animal, and natural resources since time immemorial. But due to current unhealthy conditions, the Delta's resources are diminishing. The tribal people of this area have and will always continue to be stewards of these resources for the communities that they represent, as well as the communities that live in these areas. Historical ecology and land management in the Delta by native peoples is well documented. Many different tribes tended, gathered, hunted, fished, planted, and harvested in ways that sustained the Delta's resources. Fire was important for the health of the region, for all the resources in the area. It was and still is a cultural land management tool that helps prevent wildfires, helps restore and rejuvenate, reju rejuvenate plant life and builds ecological resilience of the land. Um, Thule, Thule was also an important part of the Delta ecosystem. As a natural water filtration system, it helped clean the rivers and waterways. It improved water quality. What we're seeing now in the Delta is poor water quality and a decline of native plant life and of fish and animal populations. So we struggle to find Thule along the rivers in a region that was nearly a million acres of marshland historically. And next slide. Um, here's just a few pictures. Um, this is a part of our tech staff. Uh, one of the things that we've done is um, we built a Thule boat and that was truly inspired by reading a story about my grandmother Pamela when she was kidnapped and brought to Mount Diablo um, but she made it back home and it, there's a story of her in a Thule boat and she's coming up the river 
So Tag decided that we would make a Chuli boat. And um, this is just a Chuli house, obviously, that we would be using in the warmer seasons. Um, and so we make those every year. And uh, I think this was last year's. Next slide. Native people once harvest over 500 species of plants in the Delta. Today, only 14% of the Delta is 725,600 acres support native trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants. Where floodplains once grew an abundance of sedges that were tended to produce long straight rhizomes for baskets, we now have difficulty finding sedge beds at all. Salmon that were once so plentiful, you could walk into the rivers to catch them are now endangered and some species are on the cusp of extinction. Farming and agricultural has taken over the natural state of the Delta and failed water management strategies threaten the health of the rivers. And this is um, um, a really cool map. Um, this is the historical Delta and as you can see, it's all green. Um, so it was very plentiful in all of its plants. And then when you go to the next slide, this is the Delta today. And there's barely any green um, left. And so that's just kind of a map showing the devastation that has happened and, and where we're at and, and what's left. And this is what's left for us tribal people to, uh, to fight for. Next slide. Um, the next part of our presentation is about um, the Delta Conveyance Project and its impacts to tribal people. And I'm going to go ahead and let Crystal Moreno, who is our tech program manager, um, do this piece. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Hello, everybody. Um, as Melissa mentioned, I am the program manager for our traditional ecological department here at Shingle Springs. Um, part of my job is to staff Melissa on this Delta conveyance project that was proposed at the end of 2019. And um, Melissa is one of the tribal representatives that sits on the Delta conveyance stakeholder engagement committee. We also have Chairman Tarango from Wilton, who is the other representative. Um, and so basically this is a huge project, uh, a, another tunnel project. So prior it was called, I believe the, the California water fix. And that was a proposal that, um, that, the, that our prior governor put in place that proposed two tunnels that would be diverting water through the, from the Delta. So, Basically, what DWR did, the Department of Water Resources did, is they said, okay, well, we're, we're, we're not going to do the California water fix, but we're going to come back and propose this other project and call it the I think you might be frozen, Crystal. Regina, you are muted. Sorry about that. I didn't expect the sound to go out. If anyone has any questions, please drop them in the chat. I'm sure that Crystal will be calling right back in. Um, but if she doesn't, we only have five minutes left in the presentation anyway. Um, so um, I will just say a few things um, while we wait for her to come back. 
But um, one of the things I think that is important to think about why we talk about climate change and the Delta Tunnel proposal is that the governor is proposing right now this 3030 plan, which talks about, um, oh, sounds like Crystal's back. So she needs to be promoted to host to the Save California Salmon people. Um, but one thing I think we should think about with the 3030 plan when we're looking into climate change is how do we make sure that tribes are getting some land back and their ability to manage back. Um, so with that said, Crystal's back. Um, we have five minutes left in the presentation and she's cool. going to go on to talk about the Delta Tunnel some more. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties on our end. So um, I won't take too much more time. Um, I did want to just give that brief overview of the Delta Conveyance Project. So. Um, essentially, the so Delta conveyance refers to the water that's in um, in the Delta system, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta system. And so, what the project is proposing is to create new tunnels that would basically divert and collect even more water from our Delta system. And so, as you heard earlier on in the presentation, we already know that the condition of our Delta. Um, is at risk. We know that um, this project is not the answer. We also know that the project um, not only threatens water quality and, um, and our you know, fish and birds and wildlife, it also threatens our cultural resources. Um, literally, uh, they want, they're, they're proposing to put intake tunnels, intake sites on village sites and on burial sites. Um, we are planning to fight this. We will continue to fight it. Um, we, we know that this isn't the answer. We know that right now the Delta needs to be restored instead of further harmed and, and put it at risk. Um, we do know that the governor, the governor um, has, has basically said to us that, hey, you're either at the table or you're not. This project is moving forward. So as a result, because we work with um, several other tribes in the Delta region, um, we started convening this coalition because we all have the same common goal. We want to stop this project. And so those tribes that we've been working with, so I'm sorry, next slide. The tribes that we've been working with um, are obviously us at Shingle Springs, Wilton Rancheria, Ione, Buena Vista, Central Valley Miwok, United Auburn, and Yochadihi. And what's so critical about that is this is one of the first times that we've been able to form this coalition and we all have this common goal of stopping this project. Um, that's, how, that's how concerning it is to us. Um, like I said, we know that the construction of the tunnel and the facilities will destroy cultural sites, traditional plants, and will further threaten the existence of our fish and wildlife. Next slide. And so that's what we have for you today. If you'd like to learn more about the Delta Conveyance Project or what we do here in our tech department, or even just about the Delta in general, please feel free to contact us.